All right, and we are back here for part two. So this is lesson 12 in CENG 3306, and this is fatigue and stress concentrations. So we're moving on from pressure vessels and into a completely different topic for today, which normally I try to have each day at least some overlap, but this is not one of those days. We're going to have completely different um, topics here. So now we're moving on to uh, fatigue and stress concentrations. So for learning objectives here, we wish to explain how, fig how fatigue causes fracture in materials, um, use a stress cycle diagram, explain how discontinuities in a member cause stress concentrations, and use stress concentration factors to solve problems involving axial loading of members with discontinuities. So let's do all that fun stuff. Uh, oh yes, this is, uh, chap this is section 3.8 and 4.7 of the Hibbler book. Okay, so first we need to actually define what we mean by fatigue. You've probably heard this term before. Well, obviously you've heard it in terms of like in individuals and human fatigue and things like that, but you've probably heard of it also in terms of materials. But what exactly does this mean? What exactly do we mean by material fatigue? So let's discuss this. Um, fatigue. Fatigue. Fatigue is failure due to cyclical loading or cyclic loading. Due to cyclic loading. And I do not mean load due to due to due to tornadoes, I mean loads due to cycles with time. Um, we're talking about a load that decreases, increases, decreases, increases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is failure uh, at loads much lower than expected. Failure at loads much lower than expected. much lower than expected. Um, for example, uh, where does this occur? Things like uh, wings on planes, that's a critical one. That's caused the failure of several airlines. Airliners, I should say. Uh, wings, engines, even everyday objects like shoelaces and paper clips. In other words, if you take a, um, you've probably all taken apart a paper clip at some point in your life, and so you are, you've all had some experience with the idea of metal fatigue. In other words, if you have, if you try to, if you take a raw paper clip, or actually even better, let's say I give you the wire that a paper clip is made of, complete unbent, and I tell you to break that by bending in one go, you're probably not going to be able to do it. You're probably not going to have physically enough strength unless you're uh, Tilla the Hun to physically tear that thing apart. Um, you might be able to if you're very strong, but most likely even a common paper click, at least by at least by bending. And remember, not in. I'm asking you to break it in the first go. I don't want you to go back, bend back and forth. I want you to break it in the first go. Most likely you're not going to be able to. It's, the the material clearly has enough capacity to resist the bending that you're going to be applying. However. Um, as you all know from experience, if you bend the metal of a paper clip repeatedly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it eventually fails. And, it fa and so the load you're applying isn't very large, but it fails at a load um, much lower than you would expect. So um, let's look at, com so let's consider something like completely reversed loading. Let's look at completely reversed loading. Completely reversed loading. This is sort of the idealized um, fatigue state.
completely reversed loading. So let's see. Let's say we have a member that is undergoing, um, um, let's say on this axis, I have sigma, and on this axis, I have time. And um, then there is, uh, I have a few things. This would be my max sigma that we ever actually experience in tension, um, max tension load that we'll ever experience. And this would be our max compression load. So this is an idealized member. You're never actually going to have something this symmetric. But let's just say, for some odd reason, we have an idealized system that maybe this thing, maybe we have a member and it's just, over time, it's alternating between 10 kips of compression, 10 kips of tension, 10 kips compression, 10 kips tension. This is an idealized um, system. And so what we have is, our loading is like this. We are, alter say we're alternating via a sine wave over time, just kind of idealized loading, like so. And our average loading would be actually zero here. But other loadings are possible. And this would be our sigma average. This is just an example of it. This is just a simple way to visualize um, uh, cyclic loading. In reality, loading usually isn't that uh, this symmetric. You, what's more common typically is maybe you have a low, it's, it's rare that you have symmetric tension and compression. Maybe what you have instead is, say, a member that alternates between 5 kips of compression and 10 kips of compression. So it's always in compression, but it's alternating between them. But again, this is, cyc this is cyclic loading. And so the question is, we have seen that, um, that repeated applications on and off of small loads can cause failure at, at relatively small loads. Why? Why does this happen? And the fundamental reason is the idea of crack growth or crack propagation. Or crack propagation. So, as we discussed in the previous section, every material has a certain amount of defects, naturally. Every material has a certain amount of natural defects. You cannot manufacture, in the real world, a perfect object. So, um, you start with um, small cracks start, start at the surface. Um, let me just say a single crack. Small crack starts at the surface. Um, and this would be at the point of maximum, um, this would be at the point of max stress, um, um, at point of max stress. usually due to a void, a flaw, etc. We cannot make an idealized object, so there's always going to be some amount of um, um, imperfection there. And then the cyclic loading results in an opening of the crack, or a rapid growth of the, of the crack. Cyclic opening results in rapid growth. So let me draw that here. So it's a brittle, so you get, in other words, you get brittle failure even for a ductile material. It's a brittle failure even for ductile material. Even for a ductile material. Okay. So what happens here is that you start off with a um, small crack. So let's say we have a sample of material under repeated loading. So you have a sample of material. And we start off with a um, 
or actually let me just show you, show you the same uh, I'm going to show you instead of drawing a whole bunch of pieces I'm just going to draw one piece and show you how it looks with stress concentrations of various crack sizes so here this is the material with its complete sec with its complete cross section up here and a complete cross section down here but we have maybe a small crack here and a large crack here so up here, um, say we have a load here and a load down here, just an axial load. And um, up here, where we have the complete section intact, we have a uniform stress. So up here, we have uniform stress. And the max stress is just the sigma average equals P over A, average being the, uh, the, the total cross-sectional area. Okay, but then when you get here, we this piece of the material can't carry any load. There's a crack. This Obviously, air can't carry any load. So that means there is now going to be a local increase in the stress, and then it will even back out to the average. So there's going to be an increase. And so here we have sigma max, is greater than the sigma average. And here you're going to have an even greater peak in the stress before it levels back out again. And here we have um, sigma max is much greater than the sigma average. So what tends to happen is this is this is a this is an example of compounding failure. So you get a little crack that causes a slight increase in the stress of this location. That causes the crack to open up a bit. And then, once that happens, then the, then the, the stress becomes even more concentrated, which means you get even, um, which means you get even more concentration, which means the crack opens up even more. So this is actually how paper clips fail. They start with little microscopic defects, and by bending it back and forth and back and forth, you increase the stress, you increase the defect, the, the cracks expand, and the whole thing fails. So, um, and actually, paper clips are um, very prone to this because they're made, they're, they're paper clips. They are made of the cheapest steel you can possibly get. They are, they are crap steel. They are the worst stuff you can possibly find. They are meant, they are literally built to be thrown away. They are, you do not use very expensive, high quality steel to make a um, paper clip. So, they are very prone to, cr to, um, crack, propag to crack propagation. Okay. So let us consider the SN curve. Okay, so let us consider the SN curve. Stress versus number of cycles. We could probably call it a sigma N curve if we'd like as well. SN curve. Stress versus number of cycles. In other words, um, this tells you how many material, how many, st how many stress cycles a material can take um, for given stress, or how many material, how many uh, cycles it takes to get to uh, to get to a certain stress level. Um, in other words, we have something like this. Let me, maybe it will make more sense when I graph it out. And this is determined um, often experimentally, and then with uh, design codes that are created from that here. So on one axis, on the vertical axis, we are going to have, um, say, sigma, which is your S, your stress your ma uh, versus your number of cycles, or sorry, versus, uh, stress, or we can also call S sometimes, which it could be in KSI, megapascals, etc. Um, and then on this axis, we are going to have the number of cycles of cycles um, n, usually plotted times 10 to the sixth. So we're dealing with millions of cycles and things like that, or often even in a log scale. So in other words, um, here, we actually have sort of a logarithmic relationship. If we plot 
if we were to take a curve, uh, do a whole bunch of analysis and an experimentation, we would find that there's something like this. There's a logarithmic or a, a asymptotic relationship here, where, um, in other words, um, here, what this is showing, say we have a bunch of data points and we formed a curve from this. So in other words, if this is the stress level that we're loading to, repeatedly load, say we have, maybe this is 30 KSI, and uh, if we look, this thing can only withstand this many load cycles. If we load it at, uh, if we load at 25 KSI, it can withstand this many load cycles. If we load at 20 KSI, it can withstand this many load cycles, etc. But remember, this is a log scale, so it's really like by decreasing the load. Um, this would be a this would be a linear scale. This would be a log scale. So perhaps by reducing the load by, you know, five percent or ten percent, or even maybe say by reducing the load by twenty percent, we maybe we can extend the um, number of cycles by a factor of ten. Perhaps it's a logarithmic relationship. However, there's also a um, let me use a different color for that. There is also a limit here, which I'm going to call uh, the stress EL. S EL. And that has nothing to do with the elastic limit, for instance. That is the uh, endurance limit. Endurance limit. S EL. This is the endurance limit. That's a terrible U. Endurance limit. What do we what do we mean by this? Well, the endurance limit is the stress be uh, below which no level of failure exists. If we consider our paperclip again, if I apply a very light load to the paperclip, it will never fail. In other words, if, yes, if I bend it back and forth repeatedly, it will fail after a very short number of cycles. However, if I go and say, just pick it up, you know, if you think about picking a paperclip up by the end, if I have a paperclip, you know, like here, if I pick it up by this end, I'm actually generating loads on it, a very, 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 very slight load from just the self-weight of the paperclip. The, this section bought down here needs to be supported by this section up here. So I'm going to be pushing, I'm going to be placing the material into tension just by the paperclip's own minuscule self-weight. I can do that until the sun dies out. Unless this thing is, as long as this thing isn't rusted or corroded or broken down, that will never cause failure in the paperclip. Um, this thing, as long as the material is still pristine, you now if it's corroded and rust, that's a different story. But I can do that again and again. I can do that all day long. I can do that until uh, I can do that continuously until I keel over dead. I will never have the paperclip fail simply by doing the incredible light load of just picking it up and placing it down. Well, I guess unless I'm like simply handling it so much, I'm rubbing off material and causing the section to thin like that. But I'm talking idealized systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So let's continue. Let's look at an example one. Okay, um, now here. Um, I don't have the graphic for this, but um, I would need a handout for this to do this properly. But let's say I had a um, certain, um, so let's say this was plotted to scale. So I would need a chart, one of these, to actually do this. Um, let's say I had, I wanted to estimate, I would, let's say I have a chart that shows aluminum, a curve of this for aluminum. And I want to estimate, let's say this is for aluminum, that had some numbers on here. Um, estimate the uh, service life of aluminum subject to a um, service life of aluminum subject to a 30 KSI cyclic load. Well, 
Well, what I could do is I could go up to my chart and say, okay, 30 KSI, here's the number of cycles, boom. And um, I could say, for example, this example I have is designed to go with a chart. I don't have that handy though. Um, solution, it's simply um, 30 KSI corresponds to 3.5 times 10 to the sixth cycles. Or I could say B, um, find sigma ultimate um, for steel undergoing undergoing um, 1 million cycles service life cycles service life and I could go okay here's here's a million cycles go up move over um, that would be um, that would be Sigma equals uh, 33 KSI in other words all I want all I really want to get at is that this chart works two ways I can either start with a stress and find the number of cycles that correspond to that or I can you look at a design life and use that as a safe stress so this is actually a material this can be a material property so what this allows me to do is I can um, I can design my if I want to avoid uh, fatigue loading on a structure when if I'm designing a structure I can just say hey you know what um, if I really want to avoid it entirely I can just use this safe endurance limit and I can just keep my stress under that if I have a system that's going to be under repeated um, if I have a system that's going to be under repeated cyclic loading I can just make sure to keep my um, my stress under that endurance limit and I'm not going to have any kind of problem okay so that's fatigue. Now let us talk about uh, stress concentration. Okay. So um, let's see here. Stress concentrations. Stress concentrations. Stress concentrations. This feeds into the crack propagation stuff, or this work, this meshes with the stress, the crack propagation stuff we saw earlier. Uh, stress concentrations. But even if we don't have a crack expanding, we can still have stress concentrations. So, in other words, stresses at um, discontinuities, at discontinuities. or abrupt changes in geometry geometry changes are higher than the average stress are higher than the average stress In other words, um, let me draw two systems. Um, I'll consider first lines of force and lines of stress. So I'm going to draw two different systems, one with, with a discontinuity and one without. And I'll draw for each, I'll draw a line of force diagram and one lines of stress. Lines of force and lines of stress. All right, so say we have a load P on here. So this first, um, the first block we're going to have here, the first sample of material, is under a, sim a load P on either side, another CAL member. And the lines of force are nice and uniform. Uh, if, you, if you can't tell by my poor drawings, these are meant to be perfectly horizontal, uniformly spaced lines, like so. Perfectly horizontal, uniformly spaced lines as I drew them. Perfectly perfect drawings. 
happy trees. Okay. So then, if I do a line of do a line of stress diagram, I'm going to have this. a load P on either end, and I would have a uniform stress throughout the section. And this is just sigma ABG, the average stress. And then um, binds of force Oh, sorry, and then if I um, sorry, we, we, this is the uh, this is the member without a discontinuity or without a hole in it, and now I'm going to consider a member with a hole in it and see how the forces um, resolve themselves. So I have a force here and a force here, P, and I have a hole which I will show here. There's a, a circular hole in the middle of this plate. Now, in terms of lines of force, if we are far from the hole, um, say near the surface of the member, the uh, line of force will be basically undisturbed. This can just flow right on through. It won't be disturbed. It won't be disturbed much by the hole. However, if we have a line of force that is, say, um, lines of force that are near that, that are near the hole, or actually at the intersection of the hole, they're going to have to flow around the hole. So this is how you can start really thinking as you get higher in um, civil or mechanical engineering. This is may this may be how you start to visualize forces. Forces are like flowing water; they they flow around shapes, they flow toward support, they flow fo toward stiffness, they flow around discontinuities. Force is like le electricity or water. It flows and moves and bends and twists. So um, that's something you may learn to visualize. So force here is flowing around the hole. The lines of force have to flow around the hole um, because the force, it's, the hole itself obviously cannot carry any load. So what, we're, what, what we see here is there is now a stress concentration here. The lines would be nice and far apart, but right here, they're all bunched together. So if we look at a stress um, distribution here, what we have is something like this. We have something, well, that's way too large. We should at least make it approximately the same shape. In terms of our stress uh, distribution with our hole in the middle here, we are going to have something like this. I'm going to have my same P and P, but my stresses are going to increase. I'm going to have a, a stress here on the outside. I don't want to necessarily have it quite like that. So I'm going to have a stress here, but it's going to increase like this. And then there'll be no stress near the hole, right at, right at the surface of the hole. Nope, maybe more like that and that. And then I'm going to have a stress here, a stress here, and maybe something like that here. So in other words, I have a stress concentration um, at the location of the hole. So in other words, sigma max is much greater than sigma average, where sigma average is simply um, sigma max. Uh, let me actually do that here. Sigma max equals sigma average equals P over the overall cross-sectional area A. Here, the, the maximum stress is much greater than the average stress. All right, so let's look at that now. And from this, we are going to consider a uh, something known as a stress concentration fact, uh, factor. Stress concentration factor K. Stress concentration factor K. A. 
and k we will define as k equals sigma max over sigma average. In other words, how much, by what factor, does a local discontinuity or a change in geometry um, can we multiply the average load by to get the, um, the, stre the maximum stress at that location? So key, one key note, this k is completely dependent on geometry, not material. It depends on geometry entirely. Uh, geometry, not material. This is going to depend on geometry, not material. So this is uh, dependent on the type of load. It is, however, dependent on the type of load. On type of load. So axial torsion. torsion, flexural, etc. So if you have different types of loading, you can't use the same stress concentration factors, etc. Um, and very critical um, when using, when analyzing or using, well, if you have um, Brittle materials, it will always be critical. You'll always have to do this kind of analysis. Always. Um, ductile materials. When you have cyclic loading. with a high number of cycles. So in other words, um, larger static loads cause plastic deformations. Cause plastic deformations. So if you, there's actually a classic case study on this where um, Oh, I'm trying to remember what airline it was. There was an airline that uh, in the 1950s or 1960s that several of these planes, fairly new planes, fairly recent planes, were falling out of the sky. And so um, they were trying to figure out why. And when they actually did an analysis, what they found is, when they, it was not an analysis, when they did a thorough investigation, so these planes were just falling out of the sky. They were just breaking apart mid-flight. The, these were one of the early jetliners. Um, 1950s, 1960s, that was the time when planes were flying high enough that you actually, I mean, the first commercial air travel was back in the 1930s and um, in terms of uh, passenger jets, not passenger jets, passenger planes. But the first passenger planes didn't fly that high. They were, you know, propeller driven aircraft and they flew low enough they didn't need to pressurize the um, cabin. And even if you did that, maybe the technology didn't exist or it would have been expensive. So the, the you know, they were, if they're only flying at 10,000 feet, you can probably get away without having a pressurized cabin. People might be a little uncomfortable and cold, but they'll survive. Um, but when you start f flying at 30,000 feet or, you know, really the, the altitudes of a jetliner or a modern jetliner, you need to pressurize the cabin because you're at an altitude higher than Mount Everest. You really need to pressurize your cabin. So what happens is when a plane takes off, it pressurizes. Um, they, as, it, as they rise, they, they, they use the power of the engines to pressurize the cabin. And then as they land, they depressurize. And the next flight, it pressurizes, depressurizes, pressurizes, depressurizes. Again and again and again, it's a cyclic loading. Now, aluminum is definitely not a brittle material. It's definitely a ductile material. However, um, this is a cyclic loading. And what they found is the windows of the plane were rectangular. And this made the, the now you've probably never, if you, if you, if you think about it, a lot of you, probably most of you have been, a, have been on a plane at some time in your life, have flown at some time in your life. And, um, have you ever seen a square window on a plane? Most likely not. And the reason for, maybe you could, maybe if you flew on some really old plane that was designed to maybe a little, um, 
little uh, some little propeller driven very low altitude aircraft maybe maybe you could still find one made with square windows I don't know probably not but um, they always have round windows and the entire reason for it is because of this um, series of plane crashes that happened back in the 50s I believe and what they found is you had stress concentrations here at the corners sharp corners cause stress concentration so the plane would pressurize and depressurize and you would get stress concentrations at your windows and actually you can see the same thing in um, say in uh, in houses in Houston or in many areas of Texas if you have uh, a lot of Texas a lot of uh, at least a uh, Houston College Station I'm not sure about up in Tyler but a lot of areas have um, expansive clay soils a lot of the tech that a lot of the soils in Texas are that way and if the foundation isn't designed properly the building will repeatedly flex as the soil expands and contracts and what that causes is stress concentrations at certain critical locations namely where you have often one of the often locations for that is um, where you have square cutouts in the building frame not frame built in the building envelope for example uh, where you have windows windows and doors if you ever seen a crack along a window or a door along the along the corner that is due to a local stress concentration okay so I am going to draw a system here I'm going to draw an element and I'm going to use some stress concentration factors that are found in the textbook in section um, what, what section was this I believe 4.7 or 3.8 whichever one I forget which one of those it covers the uh, stress concentration the factors I'm using are coming from there okay so I'm going to draw what I have um, I'm going to have a shape like this um, let's see here I am going to have a shape like this a little um, object like this now um, here so I'm going to, to make a wonder another wonderful uh, three-dimensional diagram so we have a rectangular shape so we have this little lever type basically it's like a little lever type uh, object mm. it thins out it thins out like this and then we have a smaller area here have a smaller area here and also just for fun there's a hole in it here going all the way through the member so we have a member there's a hole in it here and there is a decrease in radius here and this thing is under the load P max P max and P max here okay we'll need a few notes on this dimensions etc the radius of this fillet this is called a fillet a thin uh, a small radius like this the radius of the fillet is going to be 0 0.42 inches the uh, diameter of the hole the diameter of the hole D hole is going to be 0 0.2 inches Zero point two inches. Okay, the thickness. This thing will. This which this uh, object does have a uniform thickness, and that's going to be uh, one inch. However, the heights here are not uniform. The height here is going to be um, three inches, and the height over here is going to be um, uh, six inches now there's going to be basically we're going to need to check the stress at various uh, locations and see if uh, this thing uh, works this is an example of stress concentrations and we are given 
the following. We are given that the, um, basically, we're determined this. We are asked to determine um, max axial load load, and this is going to be under um, cyclical loading as well, just for fun, using a factor of safety of 2.0, and our, um, our safe limit, our, um, our endurance limit, is going to be 26 KSI. Endurance limit is 26 KSI. SEL equals 26 KSI. So in other words, as long as we keep this thing under 26 KSI, we can load this thing back and forth as many times as we want, and we're not going to have a problem. So in, because of that, we are going to um, because of that, we're going to simply say, rather than worrying about okay, is this rather than worrying okay, uh, we can't use this object more than 100,000 times or 10,000 times, we're just going to say okay, let's just keep it under the endurance limit. We never have to worry about cyclic loading again. All right, so let's work through the solution on this. Uh, the factors I'm going to use are, again, coming from tables in the textbook. So solution. Solution. Well, actual is less than or equal to allowable. Is less than or equal to allowable. And um, let's see here. So sigma actual is less than or equal to sigma allowable, which is sigma ultimate. Although in this case, the sigma ultimate is going to be the ultimate stress that we're going to allow is 26 KSI over 2.0 equals 26 KSI over 2.0 equals 13 KSI. So we're going to keep this thing below 13 kips per square inch, and we're going to find what load is the maximum allowable load. So I'm going to check it at three places. Um, I'm going to check it at location. I'm, let, me, let me mark these locations. I'm going to have location one, the neck. Location two, the fillet, and location three, the hole. I am not going to even bother checking it at the um, the main broad cross section because I know if this is the same thickness here, if this cross section isn't going to fail, then this cross section. If if this cross section is okay, then this cross section is definitely okay. If we're not talking about any stress, con basically this is going to have no stress concentration factor. And this one won't either, right? The big cross, the main cross section right here. So if this one is okay, this one is okay. This cross section is definitely not going to control. So I'm not even going to bother checking it. So one, check at neck and find what load is allowed there. So let's say P over A over A equals sigma actual um, is less than or equal to 13 KSI, which can quickly lead us to that, um, which will lead us to that P is less than or equal to 13 KSI, and the cross-sectional area here is simply 3 times 1, 3 inches times 1 inch, which is 39 kips. So we have we can allow a maximum of 39 kips at that location. Then I need to check it at the fillet. Two, check at fillet. Check at fillet. Or the taper, where it's actually thinning out. All right, 
And let's see. So our guiding equation here is going to be, um, actually, let me do this in red. Our guiding equation is going to be K sigma average. This whole thing is our sigma max, basically. Is less than or equal to sigma allowable equals 13 KSI. And our, um, our sigma um, average is going to be uh, based upon our thinner section. So in other words, I'm going to use the average stress of this cross section, not the average stress of this cross section. So here, um, P, or actually sigma average, is equal to um, P over HT equals, um, well, that's just going to be, uh, P, sigma average is just P over HT. And then, um, let's see. Um, so there's that. That's just the sigma average at the uh, neck. And then... From the um, from figure uh, four point two three on page one sixty three in the textbook, I get that R to get to get our factors. Um, we have two possible factors. Um, we're told to check two different things. R over H. It's basically the max, the greater of these. Zero point four two over three inches. Inches equals zero point one four or W over H, which equals six inches over three inches, six inch be, being the larger height, the H being the lower one, which equals 2.0, the stress concentration factor of 2.0. And from this, the 2.01 controls, so K equals 2.0. Again, this came from a table. I'm just applying the equations I found in the table. So we need to use a stress concentration factor of 2.0. So then I can simply say, 2.0 for my um, for my stress concentration factor here times P over three inches times one inch is less than or equal to um, 13 KSI. And I get that P must be less than or equal to 19 kips. Finally, I need to check out the hole. Finally, need to check this at the hole. Which is location three I labeled. And um, I am told to use the stress concentration factor, again, also from the ta same table. Two over R is less than W, which is going to be, be equal to 0 0.2 over uh, one inch, 0 0.2 inches over one inch equals 0 0.2. And that gives us a, um, a stress concentrate, that leads us to a stress concentration factor of 2.45. Just following the equations in the table. Okay, so compared to that, it should be apparent where this is coming from. K equals 2.45. So 2.45 times P over W minus TR, or sorry, yeah, 2R, 2R times T um, equals 2.45 times P over one inch minus 0 0.2 inches times six inches. So this is just the average, this is just the average stress here, is less than or equal to um, 13 KSI. And we find that P must be less than or equal to 25.5 um, kips. So we have this limit here, this limit here, and this limit here. So it's actually going to be this one that controls. So the allowable load on this 
is 19 kips. 19 kips. Controls. So again, to recap, what we did is we found the three possible locations of stress concentration, the neck, or the fillet, and the hole. We ran through the equations of stress concentration, and those equations are derived experimentally. Basically, the way those are work is um, uh, engineering researchers over the years have basically crafted a whole bunch of different, um, uh, different plates with different radiuses and uh, loaded them until failure, until they reach their limit state. And based upon that, they have crafted relationships and derived equations saying, okay, this is the um, this is an acceptable experimentally derived stress concentration factor, and then we can now safely use those for design. So um, that'll do it for today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'll answer as best as I can. Um, the for uh, students watching this semester, uh, uh, there will be a uh, obviously your exam tomorrow, so be, be sure to be prepared for that. Look at your email for um, the instructions. If you have any questions on the instructions, please email me. Um, that'll do it again for today. This is a was a our continuing our lecture over um, this lecture again was over stress concentrations and cyclical loading and fatigue, and I will see you again tomorrow. And as always, thank you.